And yes, indeed, it is a Kyle Larson video. You heard, saw it in the intro. It is the week of the Big Machine Music City Grand Prix. I cannot wait to get down there and cover that. Link in the description to get your tickets. Show up, support IndyCar Oval Racing. That is the message that we're bringing into this video because it's going to be a big year of IndyCar Oval Racing next year as well, starting with the Indianapolis 500. And one of the question marks that we had was, would Kyle Larson return for his second attempt at the Indianapolis 500 and his first attempt <laughs> to actually complete the Indy 500 Coke 600 double? And the question was answered today. Hendrick Motorsports and Errol McLaren announced that Kyle Larson has been entered in this year's Indianapolis 500. Now, what's cool about Kyle Larson and historic about Kyle Larson, I mean, well, what isn't historical about Kyle Larson, but uh, something that's really cool that he has uh, coming into this year's Indianapolis 500 is not only is he the defending, well, he can't really defend the Rookie of the Year, he is the reigning Rookie of the Year at the Indianapolis 500, and he is the defending Brickyard 400 winner, and no driver has ever won the Brickyard 400 and then competed in the Indianapolis 500 in the next year or even competed in the Indy 500 and then gone on to win the Indy 500, the Brickyard 400 the next year. Kyle Larson is making his own way. There's no doubt about it. Historic. That's what we like about Kyle Larson. That's what we like about this. And, you know, before we get into some of the bees of this, uh, honey, uh, I would say that uh, it's great that Hendrick Motorsports and Aaron McLaren got this thing done. But... And that's where we get to the butt. There is a big butt here. Rick Hendrick, very early on in the press conference today, established that there is a pretty big caveat to this year's Indianapolis 500 attempt with Kyle Larson. Here's his comments at the presser today. And it couldn't have been a better marriage going into that race. And weather just cost us a lot. And speaking of the weather, it obviously interfered with Kyle's participation this year in the 600. I know you wanted to touch on that. Yeah, we're going to run the 600. Uh, we will be here for the 600. If that means having to cut the, the race short uh, in Indy, we will, because my commitment to NASCAR is that we're, we are, we're in NASCAR, and that's where we run for the championship. And uh, so if weather catches us, Tony will get in the car and uh, – and I don't know whether uh, he'll – what are you laughing at? You're not going to stop? <laughs> Tony. Oh, Tony. Okay. He's laughing at me. <laughs> Tony's, Tony's praying for rain. <laughs> so to spell it out in two bullet points, Charlotte and the Coke 600 is going to receive the priority this year from Hendrick Motorsports and Kyle Larson. And number two, if that does indeed be the case like it was this year where Indy gets delayed and the Charlotte 600 – goes off without a hitch, Tony Kanaan would fill in for Kyle Larson. Now, there's a lot of things to discuss about both of these points. And we'll talk about relief drivers and we'll talk about Tony Kanaan here in just a second because there's a lot of issues with some of the things that were said in that press conference, at least with how we currently understand how the Indy 500 rules are. But I want to talk about the logic and reasoning behind uh, Hendrick Motorsports and Kyle Larson prioritizing the Coke 600 over the Indy 500 because I thought it was a really gutsy, ballsy, frankly, I respected the hell out of the fact that Hendrick Motorsports prioritized the Indy 500 this year and getting Kyle Larson uh, through the 500 miles, getting him that experience this year uh, rather than rushing off to Charlotte and missing the end of the Indianapolis 500. I thought that was an awesome move by them. Ultimately, didn't hurt them in the point standings. I mean, sure, he could have won the regular season championship, whatever that means. Um, but at the end of the day, I think that they made the right decision. NASCAR did eventually cave and give them a waiver, although I think it's very important to understand some of the motivations behind why Rick Hendrick this time is prioritizing Charlotte. And I think it has a big, big influence uh, with NASCAR. So, yes, there are some advantages uh, of Kyle Larson prioritizing Charlotte. Um, and I think that the big, you know, elephant in the room, although it wasn't directly referenced, 
uh, in the in the media conference is that you know re- remember back to late May early June when there was a big question mark about whether or not Kyle Larson was going to get a playoff waiver and you know over the years we've noticed that for pretty much any reason you're going to get a playoff waiver if you miss a race in NASCAR just that's how it goes and more often than not those waivers were given within the first half of a week of that driver missing a race. Kyle Larson, it took a lot longer than that. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that NASCAR, I think, genuinely didn't want to give him a waiver because they saw it as a slight. This Again, this is what I think. I believe that they thought it was a slight that he chose Indy over Charlotte. And I think one of the provisions of giving Larson the waiver this year uh, is that Now, anytime you do this again, we don't mind you running the Indy 500. It's great that you're doing that. It's great for us. Probably gives us as much exposure, if not more, than the Indy 500. But you will never prioritize an Indy car race over us again if you want to compete for our championship. And that's why Rick Hendrick is so adamant this year that they will choose Charlotte over the Indy 500. It's actually appropriate that the press conference... Now, I would remind everyone that the press conference for this last year, when they announced it, it took place at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This year, it took place at Charlotte. So, uh, you can tell who's kind of uh, who's kind of stepping on the scales there and who's not. Um, and especially, you know, considering the fact that that Hendrick is one of the teams that signed the most recent charter agreement uh, with NASCAR, uh, they probably don't want to poke the bear at this particular moment. And perhaps were more willing to poke the bear when they hadn't uh, signed the next uh, iteration of the charter agreement. So yeah, I think NASCAR definitely stepped in here. Um, I'm glad they didn't step all the way and they they didn't do anything to prevent this from happening. Um, but yeah, definitely interesting that that Charlotte is the priority. Now here's the the deal. Rick Hendrick also mentioned, and Tony Kanaan reiterated it as did others on the panel, um, including Jeff Gordon, Zach Brown, and Kyle Larson. That was the rest of the panel. Um, that Tony Kanaan is the I will use this word very lightly, and you're going to understand why I'm going to use this word very lightly. Tony Kanaan is the relief driver for the number 17 Aero McLaren Chevrolet next year. Now, in the past at the Indianapolis 500, relief drivers have been allowed. In fact, they were most recently used in 2004 when a very similar situation to last year happened. Uh, The 2004 Indy 500 actually did get underway only a few laps into the race uh, it rained Robbie Gordon was in the race uh, with a joint venture between himself and uh, Richard Childress uh, he flew to Charlotte to run the 600 and Jacques Lazier got into the uh, number 70 Delara Chevrolet that they were racing and uh, didn't complete the race I think a half shaft broke or drive shaft broke and he was out of the race but Uh, That was the last time a driver was actually relieved during the Indianapolis 500 for one reason or another. Now, there was a big discussion because everybody knew what the weather report was going into this year's Indianapolis 500 as much as a week out. So we were, you know, looking at the practice days saying, well, okay, if it rains midway through the race or rains right before, who's going to be the relief driver? Now, we didn't understand at the time Uh, Until it was explained to us, and I mean us as just a collective, whether you're talking media fans, even the team seemed to be a bit confused about what the rules were. The rules had been changed since 2004, and as far as I can tell, they were changed around 2014, which was also a double attempt for Kurt Busch, which, you know, in the easiest way I can explain this, Indy used to be, Indy's rules used to be that the car qualified for the race and not the driver, okay? Okay. So a driver could jump in a different car and have the car still be scored um, as though it was still a relay race or some sort, right? So I think it was around the time the DW12 came in, so 2012, but the first time this ever really became a problem was 2014. Kurt Busch actually crashed his primary car on the Monday practice after the qualifications. So his qualified car was destroyed. He borrowed a backup car from Marco Andretti, but because the rule had changed that the driver now qualified for the Indianapolis 500 and not the car, 
Kurt Busch was allowed to keep his starting position. In the past, Kurt Busch, for going to a backup car, would have had to start 33rd and last. Now, the way the rule currently is, you can still change your driver before the start of the race. That's happened in recent years. Most recently, I can think of Dale Coyne Racing doing it. Uh, James Hinchcliffe got injured in 2015, and Ryan Briscoe took over his starting position uh, at the back of the field. So it's happened before, but the big thing now is the only way your car is going to the back of the field is if you change drivers, and you can only change drivers and declare that before the start of the race. If the race has begun and Kyle Larson has taken the green flag, and let's say the race gets red flagged or Kyle Larson pulls off of the racetrack um, at some point in the middle of the race because the race is running too long, if he gets out of that car and does not return to it, no other driver can get into that car and finish the race. That's how the rule is currently written. That is how the rule is currently written. And we, we've been talking a lot about IndyCar's old self over the past few days. And this is another example of IndyCar's old self being exactly what they need to be. Because I made this point very clear in May, and I'm going to make it very clear again. This is a rule that should go back to the way that it was. There was nothing wrong with the old rule. It doesn't make any sense that if Kyle Larson had to step out of that race car and fly to Charlotte, that you would have to park the 17 car, park its sponsors, park that Chevy engine, park the engineer who's working on the car, park the crew, park every bit of that effort because you have a driver that's totally capable, Tony Kanaan, previous winner of the Indianapolis 500, one of the greatest drivers in the recent years of IndyCar, who can most assuredly jump in that car and be very safe about it. And you're not going to let that happen. And the fact that the rule, I get it. It was 20 years ago, right? 2004, I can't believe it, but it was 20 years ago. What does it hurt? And how much of a benefit is it to have Tony Kanaan involved as a driver in the Indy 500? How important is it that Kyle Larson's car sponsors and crew get to continue in the race if the worst case scenario does happen. I think the benefits far outweigh the negatives here, and it's not even close. This rule needs to be changed if it hasn't been already. Now, with the way Rick Hendrick and Tony Kanaan and Jeff Gordon and Kyle Larson were all speaking, it sounds like they're under the impression that they're going to be able to do this. Tony Kanaan even stated that he is planning on taking a refresher test in either October or April to be ready and prepared for the Indianapolis 500. So they are very serious. This is absolutely the plan. So it says to me that they're aware of something that maybe we're not so aware of right now. And potentially the old times, the good old times are coming back. And that's exactly, exactly how it should be. So in conclusion, a couple of things to talk about here. First of all, I think the, the idea of, Tony Kanaan kind of being around and having to take practice laps, that's great for the sport. Whether he's allowed to take part in the Indianapolis 500 after Kyle Larson has driven the car or not, um, I think the hype, just the, the fact of Tony getting in a car and doing laps, that's the fun stuff. That's the fun stuff of May. That's the fun stuff of Indianapolis, the Indianapolis 500. That's what, what makes it a unique event. It's fun and exciting that Kyle Larson's getting to do this again. It's awesome that he's going to get to do the double. Hopefully, that's his goal. But I think more importantly, the fact that you have the rookie of the year from last year coming back, you have a driver uh, with Aero McLaren who has a legitimate shot to win the race. Uh, he's a previous NASCAR champion. I mean, hell, he could win the championship this year with NASCAR's format. Um, you have the previous Brickyard 400 winner running the Indianapolis 500. That's never happened before. I think that's absolutely insanely cool. Um, in fact, you know, you want to talk about the benefits of Kyle Larson and why this is so important. I bet if you put him in the most popular driver poll for the Indianapolis Five or for the IndyCar series as a whole over the year, I bet you he'd give Pato Award a run for his money, if not win that award outright after only running one race in the year. For his efforts last year at the Indianapolis 500, I think this about Kyle Larson. Um, he did kind of exactly what I expected him to do. I mean, I don't think he necessarily exceeded my expectations. He had a very good qualification. He looked very, very solid in practice. He learned throughout the week. Um, 
Aaron McLaren finally kind of got him out in traffic, which was kind of my concern uh, towards the end of practice. And he figured that out very quickly. Now in the race, he did make a couple of mistakes. I think back to one of the early restarts when he absolutely got swamped, almost got crashed because he was getting uh, passed so quickly by his other competitors. And of course, the speeding penalty towards the end of the race, which took him out of a top 10 position. But I think that the body of work is undeniable. Kyle Larson understands IndyCar racing. He understands the Indianapolis 500. He can win this race, especially in his second try, having made some of those mistakes that he needed to make. And that's why I respect that Hendrick Motorsports decision last year so much is that he had to make that race. He had to learn through the entire race. And now that he's done that, he can win. That's what's going to be so fun about May of 2025. And October for the test and April for the test. Why don't we just take all those days and put them in May? I don't know, but that's a story for another time. Thank you guys so much for watching. Appreciate you guys. Can't wait to see you all in Nashville this weekend for the Big Machine Music City Grand Prix. We'll see you then.